Right. Since we're in the Quran, since we're looking at the different titles in the Quran that don't make sense, including the name Muhammad, there are other titles that come up, uh, unfamiliar titles uh, that just we don't know where they are. And Mel, you're going to help us with that. You're going to unpack some of these titles uh, that are well known in Arabic, but they actually have antecedents in Jewish and Christian uh, and therefore are quite familiar in the 7th century. It's just that Muslims don't know about them. Over to you. What are these? Who are these jinn, these kafirs, these galuts, and these taluts? Yeah, so some of these titles are confusing because they're often embedded into biblical stories. So they're kind of, they're hidden in plain sight, essentially. Um, and of course, you do need to have lived at that time to know who, who these are referring to. So unfortunately, for most of us living in the 21st century, these are completely foreign to us. But um, for those writing the Quran and those reading it, this should have been really obvious to who, who these were being referred to. Unfortunately, when the standard Islamic narrative took over, and, and obviously that was written many centuries later, the meanings of all of this was lost. And so um, for a lot of Muslims today, uh, there's, a, there's a big portion of the Quran that just makes no sense. There's about maybe 20%. One of the reasons why so much of the Quran doesn't make sense is we've lost touch with the earlier meaning. So hopefully this um, episode today will actually clarify some of these key figures. So with that, I'll share my PowerPoint. So the question is really, who are the Jen, the Kafir, the Galut and the Talut? Um, these are um, often heard of uh, and read in the Quran, but they, they're they kind of odd. Some of the, these names seem to be used in a, in a really odd way that doesn't make sense. So hopefully this will clarify some of these. The short answer to who these are is these are all top contemporary Jewish leaders of the 7th and 8th centuries AD. So a source of internal conflict. Um, this is taken from A.J. Juice's paper, Sijin and Jen. The first Gaon of Sura was Mar Rab Mar of 609. Um, a Gaon now, just to remind people, is a leader of a Jewish academy, which is called the Yeshiva. Since then, the Gaonim, which is the plural of Gaon, were in stark conflict with the other rabbinic Jews and also with Karite Judaism. Karite and Haran Jews acted as the heirs of Sadducee ideals, which would accept the Torah, but reject the petrification of oral traditions as practiced by the Babylonians. Now I'll stop here before I go into more of this. So essentially what AJ Jews is identifying is a, a conflict between those Jews that leaned more towards a Sadducee point of view, who were mostly in the West and those Jews in the East that leaned more towards a Pharisee idea of Judaism, which was comfortable with oral traditions. Um, I don't know if you want to come back on any of that before I go for, forward. But yeah, no, that's good. It's good that you're delineating because we're all familiar with the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. What you're saying is they continued to have significant differences, Pharisees in the East and the Sadducees in the West. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. So the sectarian conflicts between Karaites and Rabbinic Jews in Alexandria of 641 AD attest to this important split. Thus, for as little as we know, between 609 and 641 AD, various Jewish groups were engaged in open conflict. And this is the backdrop to the early writings of the Quran. We're not talking about the, the finished product in the 8th century, but there was something that was being referred to in the early days and obviously developed over the decades afterwards. So the Quran reflects some of these quarrels and just like the Talmud recounts different opinions, the Quran sometimes criticizing one side, sometimes the other. Um, and just an observation here in passing, the first Gaon of Surah was Mar Rab Mar uh, uh, as of 609 AD. In Islamic tradition, Muhammad gets his first revelation in 610 AD. Might be just a coincidence, but we're, we're seeing how these two um, events line up, the historical one versus the, the standard Islamic narrative one. Um, and notice the, the place, Surah, which is in Iraq. Um, the 
sections in the Quran are actually called surah as well. Is this a coincidence? I ask, <laughs> you know, so there's a few little hints here. The Babylonians replaced the Jerusalem Nazi, nothing to do with Nazi, by the way. Um, this is another uh, Jewish leader, kind of like the Exilarch, uh, but more typically in Israel. So the Babylonians replaced the Jerusalem Nasi with a number of functionaries or judges, which no doubt would have caused friction amongst those Jews that favored the Nasi. So the Dian or Jen is the first one that we're going to take a look at. And again, this is from AJ Juice's um, uh, article. The the Dean or Jen are the rabbinic judges. The Babylonians replaced the Jerusalem Nasi with the Abbet uh, Dean, the father of the court, the Rosh Bet Dean, the head of the court, the Dayan, which is the rabbinic judge, which is the plural is Dayan Nim, and the Haver Bet Dean, the friend of the court or expert in law or science. The date of cessation of the Simica is unclear, but also irrelevant. However, if the Semica and the Nasi had died out at some point in the 5th century, they would likely be resurrected at another, in particular with the beginning of the Geoni. Schisms between Jewish academies over the leadership of the Nasi are well documented in the Talmud. So, if you're, you're not getting this, essentially the Dean or the Jen are Jewish judges, and they got introduced in the early part of the 7th century. So it's contemporary with the time frame of the Quran as, as you know, given to us. And if we look at this map here, we can see that Surah is right smack in the middle of uh, Iraq there, which in the bottom yellow. And there's also another curious place further up the river Euphrates called Haditha, um, which makes me wonder, are are these two locations the inspiration for the names of two important Islamic documents? You have the Surah, which is the 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 um, documents that made up the Quran, and then you have Haditha, which is essentially the same as had Hadiths, the stories surrounding um, the standard Islamic narrative. It could be a coincidence, but it seems quite a remarkable coincidence that we have now two there. Um, do you want to come back on any of this? No, but it sounds, if, if you are going to be borrowing, as we're seeing, so much of the Quran is borrowed, you also then are borrowing the references, the names for the different uh, institutions, and also you would be borrowing in Arabic the same type of ideas, then surah, which would be, in this case, a place, then becomes a book, the name for the, the t title for a book. And then haditha, which is, again, another place up along, is that the Euphrates River? both of them are on the Euphrates Bitter River, then would then be taken to make the this, this sayings. So I can see that this may be the answer. We don't know. There's no way of knowing that, but it, it is coincidental. It seems almost too coincidental. Yeah. Like Sura um, and Pompadita were the two most important academies in, um, in Iraq. In fact, in the entire Jewish community in the world, you know, worldwide. So okay. this wasn't a, uh, this look, wasn't just any old place. It was very important. And just look at the map there. Notice that they're both around Stesiphon, which is the archaic name of what later became Baghdad. Also just north of Kufa, which is the place that became the head of all of the Islamic teaching. When Islam endured the Abbasid Empire, Kufa became a place where all the seminaries are. It stands to reason it would be there because that's where all the other academies were. These Jewish academies were all around that area. So if that's where the Jewish academies are, stop and think, Mel. When you look at the Quran, look at all the discussions that are happening. These are theological discussions. You can, have, you can only have theological discussions when there are large numbers of Jews and Christians to have the theological discussions with, because they're all, even in the Quran, they're all in confrontation or discussions between Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Stands to reason, look where the academies are. That would then understand then why these then became, took on such importance as far as the titles later on. Absolutely. Um, you have Hira, only a stone's throw away from Surah, which is where the biggest Christian community was in the area. Um, uh, so, it makes perfect sense. Um, so let's go on from there. So we have the Babylonian deans or 
Jinn, which replaced the Jerusalem Nasi, hence the Quranic term Jinn, and it's, you know, it's pronounced the same, um, and I've already mentioned that, that part there. So we have it in Surah 72.1, for example, um, say, O Prophet, uh, it has been revealed to me that a group of Jinn listened to the Quran. Now, the Quran could actually be Kiriana, which is the lectionary. It doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means here. And said to their fellow Jinn, indeed, we have heard a wondrous recitation. Now, let's just think about this for a second. Um, if we look at this in terms of the standard Islamic narrative, we think these are like spirits, uh, like... Um, what would it be the equivalent gen would be like um almost evil like spirits, demons demons what was that evil spirits or demons yeah but actually now that we know that there's a group called the gen which are literally um human beings who are judges now it actually makes more sense it's been revealed to me that a group of judges listened to the 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 lectionary the quran and said to their fellow judges Indeed, we have heard a wondrous recitation. So this actually makes more sense than the standard Islamic narrative. Um, now it's pulled out of uh, out of its original meaning and it's been distorted. You know, you do know that Jinn are the ones who are listening to the Quran, and that's why they have. If you if you look, that's why these meteorites are being thrown at them. When you look up in the sky, you see meteorites being shooting across the heavens. They're there to chase the jinn away from listening to the Quran being recited up in heaven or up in paradise, straight above earth. So okay, if, here's the reference to it. Here are the jinn, these judges, who are the ones who are listening to the Quran, the, uh, the, the writings. Yeah, so, so when it's talking about listening to the Quran here, it's actually not even referring to itself because the Quran obviously hasn't been, as we understand it, hasn't been written yet this is just one line from uh what would become the quran if, do you know what i mean so when they're talking about the quran here it's actually some other document which is actually if we look at the aramaic quran just means um lectionary it's kiriana um so even that is is a source of confusion so listening to the quran could in this context could simply mean that the the jewish judges were listening to the scripture it could be as simple as that. So it's very different. It's very normal. It's nothing crazy. There's no meteorites. There's no superstitious stuff involved. It's very ordinary meaning. So okay. it seems more, more sensible. So let's have a look at this term, Jalut or Galut. Now, it's in, in the Arabic, it's written as Jalut, and it's pronounced in some um, Arab countries as Jalut, but it's still pronounced as Galut in places like Egypt. Um, so let's have a look at what it says. This is Surah 2, 251. So they defeated them by Allah's will and David killed Goliath. That's how this translator has translated uh, Jalut. And Allah blessed David with kingship and wisdom and taught him what he willed. Had Allah not repelled a group of people by the might of another, corruption would have dominated the earth, but Allah is gracious to all. Now, if you look at, at why they, they um, translated uh, Jalut to Goliath, it makes sense because we know David killed Goliath. That's what that's kind of obvious, and and you can see how the translator went for Goliath there. But they're assuming too much with that um, translation. If we actually look at the word um, Jalut or Galut and look at the historical context, we actually find a more direct meaning for the word, and it's got nothing to do with Goliath. So if we look here, we can see that the Exilarch. Um, which is the Greek form of that leader of the entire Jewish community. The Hebrew version of the name is Rosh HaGola. And if we look at it in the Aramaic, it's Galuta. And in the Arabic, it's Ras Al Galut. Okay, so that Jalut is actually the Exilarch, directly the, the Exilarch. There's only one of them at any time. So it's a very specific term. Galut means the exilarch. Um, so when we talk about David killing the exilarch, that may have a contemporary meaning. So that could refer to um, a messianic figure killing the exilarch. It could be even um, one messianic, messianic figure killing another one. It, it could have lots of potential meanings 
but something different to Goliath. Uh, another title that is referred to in the Quran is Talut, which is the rhyming pair of Galut. Talut is referring to the Geo name, which is the, the leaders of the academies who are also Pharisees. And it's connected to the word Talith, which is an Aramaic word from the root TLO, which means cover. Okay, because the talit is like a shawl that the Jews wore on their head, particularly Pharisaic Jews would wear this, hence the, the name Talut. In Talmudic times, this already referred to the Jewish prayer shawl, and it's actually related to the word kafir, which is often mistranslated to mean infidel. But actually, the root of this is kufar, which is coverers. And there are 491 occurrences of this term in the Quran. And related to that is actually jinn. It's a derogatory term for the geo name, the judges. Um, I'm going to send it back. I'm doing a lot of talking there. Um, what's your take on this, Jay? Okay, so you're saying that almost every one of these, we can see if we look back into Jewish material, these are all referred to. We know who they are. Uh, the uh, the Jalut are the the exilarchs. That would be the Arabic, Quranic Arabic for Jalut. The Talut would be the leaders of the academies. And we saw where the academies were. They're all around Stesiphon. And then the Kufar, which is found 491 times, are the coverers. That's the root for the coverers. I assume what you mean by covers, what does that mean? Like the prayer shawl covers or those who cover scripture? Actually, both. It, it has. It's a nice word, and that's why they, they liked it, because it had a, like a symbolic meaning, but also a direct meaning. So the, the complaint from the Sadducee side of things, if you remember earlier on, we mentioned that the Sadducees um, wanted people to stick to just the Torah. They didn't want any oral traditions. So their complaint about the Pharisees was they were covering up the meaning with their oral traditions. All of this, you know, oral additions that they're, you know, building up in the Talmud. They didn't want any of that. So from their point of view, they were the Kafir, the Kufar, because they were covering up the Torah with all this human um, teaching that they were adding to it. That was their complaint. That's why they're being referred to in a very derogatory term, the Kufar. Um, and the, the gen is a, just another term, which was actually just um, a, a Jewish term for the judges that were ruling in the courts. So this all connected. Hold on a minute. So you're saying that the jinn, which you said earlier, are uh, is the Jewish judges. Yes. Yeah. The derogatory term for them? Well, it was it, it, it was being it was being used originally as um, you know just a straight term for them but in terms of the way it's been used at least in some parts of the Quran it gives over a kind of a uh, a negative vibe in the way that they're presented I suppose it's more in the the context in which the word is used it kind of comes over in a kind of derogatory sense because they're the the Quran writers are basically saying that these guys are getting it wrong they're taking people away from the scripture they're adding their human traditions onto the original meaning that's their main complaint okay Hope that makes sense well, okay well. um so um aj juice uh says that on several occasions in his annals al tabari mentions that the raz al jalut i.e the exilarch or head of the captivity who was the official representative of the jewish community at the court of the abbasid caliphs and the Jewish counterpart of the Catholicos, who represented the Christians, um, he says the office of Exilarch had been instituted by the Sasanian kings of Persia and was continued by the Abbasids. In none of his references to this Jewish dignitary does Al Tabari indicate what his functions entailed, and in one case, he even anachronistically presents him as a contemporary of Jesus and Pilate. Now we can ignore some of the the nonsense that al tabari um reportedly said um but i think the the key thing there is that al tabari acknowledges that jalut or galut is the exilarch okay and that's key so even a few centuries after the time of the quran al tabari is acknowledging that that's actually what the galut is 
So that, and there's the, the reference in Al Tarbury for those who want to have a look. So in summary, the, the Jalut or Galut in the Quran refers to the Jewish Eklark. The reference is often just taken as referring to Goliath. The Talut and the Kafir are both the rabbinic Jews who wear their talits and cover up the meaning of the scriptures with oral traditions. These are the Geonim, plural of Geon, the leaders of the Jewish academies. And the Jens are the human judges in the Jewish courts, the, the Dean or Jen. The Geonim may also be referred to as the the gens or the gen maybe and interestingly in connection with this the sharia courts copied the model given in these um and lloyd de young is uh, especially um has has done a lot of work on that area so okay so this is um uh, you know this is what we've always said and this is something that's important uh we've always said if you're going to find out what the quran is saying or what the traditions are saying you need to go and ask not what they thought in the ninth century or 10th. You need to find out what was happening in the seventh. This has been our modus operandi for all of these series and everything that we've done, haven't we, Mel? And we yeah. said, it doesn't do us any good to waste our time with the ninth and 10th century. Let's go back to the seventh century. And that's exactly what you've done. You and AJ Dios. what you're doing is you're going back and you're taking these words, which have antecedents. They are, they make sense. Once you go back to the seventh century, and when you go back to the seventh century, you will find Jalut and Gulut. What are these people? Uh, these are, this is the Jewish exilarch. When you go back to the seventh century, the Talut and Kafir, uh, they're both rabbinic Jews. That makes sense now, if you look at it in the context of that time. The Jinn, uh, these were judges in the Jewish court. They're all Jewish. They are all have Jewish antecedents, which makes sense when you look and see what's happening in that part of the world, up north, not down in Medina and Mecca, way up at where the Quran was being put together, where these traditions are all, notice all the traditions, whether it's the Sira or the Tafsir or the Hadith or the Tahrik, all of them are written in what is now today Baghdad. That used to be Stesiphon. And Stesiphon is where all these cities were. That's where Sura is. That is where Kufa is. That is where Hira is. And that's where the Jews and the Christians were percolating all these ideas. It stands to reason if you're going to then pull out that material that we now see in the Quran and pull out the material that you see in all these references, they would be borrowing those, even those names, and then putting different meanings to it. But they were similar to the meanings that were always there. They just use them in demog uh, in mocking them or they would use them as a corruption of them so it's great that we're finding from the seventh century this is now unpacking an uh, an awful lot of what the quran is saying that has been a, a real problem for muslim scholars and western scholars today they just don't know where this word jinn comes from or salut and talut and uh, where these reference to uh, the kafir especially the kafir kufar the ones who are covering uh, so you can see, stick it, take go back to the seventh century, and it all makes it very clear. Thanks so much for doing that. This is what we've done with the word Muhammad. We've gone back to the seventh century and even earlier to find out where that name or where that title came from. We need to do so also with these other terms. The more we scratch, the more we find. The more we find, the more we shine. The more we shine, the more they whine. Oh, how sublime. It's just, again, uh, if we're not going to call out, if we're not going to cry out, if we're not going to speak, then the rocks and, in this case, the historical references will cry out for us. God bless you. Thanks so much. What's the, what are we going to do next? So, um, yeah, so I'm going to be referring to the, these um, strange references, the Sidjin and uh, uh, Iliyun. Um, they're often depicted as heaven and hell, but it's actually not the case. Again, they are, they've got a connection to those titles that we've just covered. So that's in the next episode. Okay. Until that time, hmm. you have the comments below. Come back to us, see what you say, see if you agree. Maybe you don't. We'd love to hear from you. All right. This is Jay and Mel, thousands of miles apart, over and out. Okay.